I'm looking for the magic thumbs up. Tells me we're live on candid camera, not candid camera. I got it. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Eisenach, and I'm a visiting scholar uh, here at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, it's a wonderful pleasure for us today to welcome uh, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai to the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, over the course, well, I've known Ajit for some years, but over the course of the past several months, I've had the opportunity to get to know him better uh, in my role uh, as part of the Trump uh, transition team for the Federal Communications Commission. And uh, when people ask me about that, I, I tell them that of all of the various transition teams uh, uh, for the Trump transition, uh, I had the lightest lift uh, of all. Uh, and that's because we had these two wonderful Republican commissioners uh, present and in place uh, at the FCC, and, and people would ask me, what would the Trump, what would the Trump administration's communications policy agenda be after the inauguration? And I said, well, don't ask me. Uh, go to the FCC website and read the dissents uh, of Ajit Pai and Mike O'Reilly over the course of the past few years, uh, and you'll see you'll see it spelled out in with tremendous substance and detail. Um, I want to talk for just a second about. Um, Ajit's accomplishments uh, over the past 102 days. Um, obviously, there's some controversial issues in front of the commission, uh, but there's some issues in front of the commission which ought to be, at least ought to be less controversial, and Ajit has taken those on with, um, at a pace and with a level of substance and success far more akin to an internet startup than a typical Washington moribund bureaucracy. Um, first of all, Ajit has put in place common sense procedural reforms like making notices, orders public before they're voted on by the commission. What a concept. Uh, you thought that could have happened before. Uh, Revoking the staff's editorial privileges, so after the commission votes on something, the staff now actually has to carry out what the commission voted on instead of rewriting it under historical editorial privileges. Uh, and, uh, and many of these are bipartisan, and, and uh, including another one being simply telling the staff that when a commissioner, even a commissioner from the other political party, asks you for information about a proceeding or something going on at the commission, you should answer the question. Now, you would think that's all just good government, but it is the antithesis of the previous four years under the previous chairman who we won't name here. Um, chairman Pai has also taken a weed whacker to the regulatory underbrush, little noticed changes, eliminating unnecessary paperwork requirements, uh, and uh, at the other end of the spectrum, actually requiring that companies applying for government subsidies demonstrate their bona fides uh, to receive those subsidies and spend them in a responsible way. What another concept. On the substantive front, uh, it's been change after change after change, all of them in the spirit uh, of uh, another uh, FCC chairman uh, 17 years ago, uh, Chairman Bill Kennard who spoke eloquently about the need to create an FCC for the 21st century to clean out the regulatory underbrush, to move from a system of silos and heavy-handed ex-ante regulation to a competition-based framework, an enforcement-based framework of ex-post regulation consistent with the increasing competitiveness of the telecommunications marketplace. And on issue after issue, uh, Chairman Pai has moved that agenda along, including the uh, very visible uh, issues, which I'm sure we'll get into today, but also less vis visible issues, uh, something as important as beginning the process of deregulating the marketplace for business data services, which is essentially the internet backbone uh, services, uh, and, uh, and which is and has been competitive. We're finally going to get around to deregulating that. And something as you might think mundane or technical as uh, beginning the process of um, permitting uh, LTEU into the marketplace, allowing new technology 
technologies to be rolled out without the heavy hand of government slowing innovation. Uh, so I've, I've talked long enough. I, I'm not going to give a long introduction uh, of Ajit. Uh, he is uh, currently chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. Previously, he was a member of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, prior to that, he served in the general counsel's office at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, his dedication to the agency, I think, is an important part of his success. Um, and it's, it's worth, I think, going back and looking at his first speech as chairman, which was to the staff of the agency, reassuring them uh, that his purpose is to advance the agency and its professional staff not to attack it. Um, and I think that's been another component of his chairmanship that's been so important. Um, lest we forget, uh, Ajit graduated uh, from Harvard University. He received his law degree from the University of Chicago, where he was editor of the Law Review. Uh, and so we are dealing not only with a great leader, uh, but a um, tremendous intellect. Ajit Pai, thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, Jeff, for those very kind words. Uh, thanks to the entire team at AEI uh, for putting this event together. Uh, Jeff, I especially appreciate the comparison to uh, former Chairman Bill Kennard, uh, distinguished public servant and uh, someone I can now call a friend. Uh, to be mentioned even in the same sentence as uh, Chairman Kennard is a high honor indeed. It is great uh, to be back here at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, being here today reminds me that uh, 2016 was a time of great change in Washington. Looking back, it's clear that we witnessed a momentous event, uh, one that I'm sure caused many people some consternation, uh, brought tremendous joy to others, and required a lot of people to pack up their offices and move out. I'm referring, of course, to AEI's decision to move into this wonderful new space after many years on 17th Street. Congratulations on the, on the move. Uh, but in all seriousness, AEI and its scholars have done tremendous work by making the case for expanding freedom, for extending individual opportunity, and for strengthening America's free enterprise system. And in particular, AEI has shown thought leadership on communications policy. And much, if not most, of the credit for that goes to Jeff Eisenach, who uh, has really done so much work over the years, including uh, during the transition that he mentioned. So thank you, Jeff, for your scholarship, uh, for your friendship, and for your counsel. Uh, now, earlier this week, uh, as Jeff pointed out, we reached the 100-day mark as my tenure, of my tenure as chairman. It sure doesn't feel like 100 days, I have to tell you. It's, uh, uh, time flies much more quickly in this job than it did uh, when I was in the minority. But by any objective measure, we've hit the ground running, and we have had a very productive three-plus months at the FCC. Here's here just one data point for your consideration. To, uh, in my first 100 days, the FCC adopted 49 items. Now, to put that number in perspective, during the prior two permanent chairman's first 100 days, the commission adopted 25 and 34 items. I know what you're thinking. You know, as legendary UCLA basketball coach John Wooden once said, never mistake activity for achievement. Uh, so I thought it would be helpful this morning to highlight uh, some of the actions we've taken and to explain how they fit into a broader strategic vision. And that vision includes five goals that are important to me and hopefully to you. Number one, closing the digital divide. Number two, modernizing our rules. Number three, promoting innovation. Number four, protecting consumers and uh, public safety. And number five, improving the agency's operations. These are the goals that I've emphasized since I arrived at the FCC almost exactly five years ago today. These are the goals that have shaped and animated my first 100 days as chairman, and these are the goals that I hope will be the agency's beacon in the years to come. So let's start with closing the digital divide. On my first full day as chairman, as Jeff pointed out, I delivered remarks to the agency's fantastic and talented staff, and I focused on one issue, bringing the benefits of the digital age to all Americans. And this principle goes back to the commission's founding statute. Section 1 of the Communications Act of 1934 charged the FCC with making communications services available, so far as possible, to all the people of the United States. And to me, at least, this mission is more vital than ever. After all, broadband opens doors to opportunity in almost every aspect of modern American life, whether it's looking for a job, 
getting medical uh, care, doing your homework, keeping in touch with friends and family, or engaging with your fav favorite regulators. Uh, that was a joke, actually. Uh, <laughs> I'm here all week. Yeah. Uh, but Broadband has also given rise to what I've called the democratization of entrepreneurship. Uh, with a powerful plan and a digital connection, you can raise capital, you can start a business, you can hire people, and you can reach a global customer base from anywhere in America. And so I believe that every American who wants to participate in our digital economy should be able to do so. Access to digital opportunities should not depend on who you are, where you live, what you look like, or where you're from. But to be clear, we are not where we need to be. If you live in rural America, you are much less likely to have high-speed internet access than if you live in a city. If you live in a low-income neighborhood, you are much less likely to have high-speed internet access than if you live in a wealthier area. The digital divide in our country is real, and it is persistent. It makes it harder for many of our fellow American citizens to improve their lives, and it takes a significant toll on America's economy and our global competitiveness. When I became chairman, the FCC needed to step up its efforts to close this gap, and that is exactly what we've done. My first two meetings as FCC chairman involved conversations with consumer advocates and small broadband providers on ways to promote digital empowerment. My very first vote as chairman was to partner with the state of New York to deliver $170 million for broadband deployment in upstate areas where residents have been bypassed for far too long. And the first commission meeting for which I had the power to set the agenda featured two significant measures to expand broadband access in unserved areas. One was an order passed unanimously to bring mobile broadband to millions of Americans through what is known as the Mobility Fund Phase 2. Now, previously, the FCC was spending about $25 million a month of taxpayer money to subsidize wireless carriers in areas where private capital was already doing the job. We are redirecting that spending and more, $4.53 billion over the next decade, in order to bring 4G LTE service to rural Americans who don't have it today. And we're doing it in an efficient, fiscally responsible way by using a competitive reverse auction to allocate those funds. Now, at the same meeting, we decided, again on a bipartisan basis, to move forward with $2 billion in wired broadband investment through what's called Phase 2 of our Connect America Fund. Here, too, we set up a competitive bidding process to get the most bang for the buck in terms of bringing high-speed internet access to currently unserved rural Americans. Our rules for this auction will encourage a wide range of entities to compete and to participate, from wireless internet service providers to electric utilities. Now, these two capital investment plans will bring internet access to many unserved Americans, and they'll put Americans to work building next generation networks in rural America. But these were just parts of the opening act. Our most recent FCC meeting included three initiatives designed to make it easier for companies to build and expand high-speed broadband networks. We launched, again unanimously, a proceeding to lower costs and speed the deployment of new wireline infrastructure, to speed up the transition from copper networks to modern fiber networks. And this means that more money will be spent on the resilient technologies of tomorrow, not the fading networks of yesterday. And we launched, yet again unanimously, a proceeding to facilitate the deployment of the hundreds of thousands of small cells that will power the 5G networks of tomorrow. And we eliminated, still yet again unanimously, a rule that needlessly penalized rural carriers, uh, telephone companies, for deploying broadband to certain parts of their communities. Now looking ahead, we also want to explore fresh ideas for tackling the long-standing challenge of this digital divide. And to that end, we created the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee, a panel of experts to make recommendations to the FCC about strategies to promote better and faster and cheaper broadband. Over 380 individuals applied to serve on this committee, representing community groups, community organizations and customer, uh, consumer organizations, government and industry, a diverse and highly impressive pool of applicants. We recently invited 29 individuals to serve on this committee, led by the highly talented Elizabeth Pierce, uh, the CEO of Quintillion Networks, and Kelly Cole of the Utah Broadband Outreach Center. 
Uh, the BDAC, as we call it, held its first meeting last month, and I expect it will make a major difference in our work to connect all Americans. Now, some of the actions we've taken to spur broadband deployment and to close the digital divide uh, dovetail with our second major priority, which is modernizing the Commission's rules and eliminating unnecessary regulatory burdens. Now, you often hear about how regulatory red tape imposes real costs and stifles investment and innovation. And here's one statistic that gives you a sense of how real and how significant those costs are. According to the Office of Management and Budget, the FCC imposes $800 million each and every year in paperwork burdens. That's right, $800 million each year. And this doesn't count the money that people must spend paying workers to fill out all of this paperwork. And again, these are only the FCC's paperwork burdens that I'm talking about. Uh, the reg total regulatory burden that the FCC places on the private sector is actually much higher than that. To me, at least, the fundamental question is this. Do we want that money to be diverted to lawyers and accountants figuring out how to comply with the FCC's regulatory requirements? Or do we want it to be spent delivering American consumers better and faster and cheaper internet access? I mean, no offense to my friends in the communications bar, but to me at least, the answer to that question is pretty clear. Now, paperwork aside, we are reviewing the FCC's rules across the board and deciding which ones still make sense in the digital age. As part of this review, we're asking whether the costs of a rule outweigh the benefits. When the facts warrant, we will not hesitate to revise overly burdensome rules or to repeal them altogether. And you don't need a weatherman to know that the wind is blowing certain FCC rules towards modification or elimination. And that's especially true, by the way, for small businesses. Federal regulations have a disproportionate effect on these companies. And these companies, remember, are often the linchpin to a more competitive marketplace, and they don't have the compliance resources to withstand a regulatory onslaught. I'm very sensitive to the impact that our regulations can have on such businesses. And that's why, in my first week as chairman, I proposed to relieve small internet service providers from costly and overly burdensome reporting requirements associated with the Title II order. And we did that in February. And this is just one example of many uh, that illustrate how we are modernizing our rules. We also relaxed unnecessary command and control regulations for business data services to create greater incentives for the private sector to invest in next generation networks. We streamlined various accounting requirements for many wireline carriers, requirements that literally require them to maintain two different sets of books. We eased reporting burdens for volunteer board members of non-commercial broadcasters. We updated our interpretation of our equal employment opportunity rules to account for the ways that people actually look for jobs today. And we eliminated two filing requirements, broadcasters' public correspondence files and cable operators' principal head-in locations that no longer made any sense. Now, I recognize that as I go through this litany, these decisions and others like them might seem like small potatoes. But remember what former Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen once had to say about spending. A billion here, a billion there, and pretty soon, you're talking real money. <laughs> well, so too, as we go about eliminating a rule here and a rule there, we will end up substantially adjusting our rules to match the realities of the modern marketplace. And that is something that is good for consumers and good for companies alike. Now, the third key FCC priority I mentioned is promoting innovation across the communications industry. I might be new to the chairmanship, but I have served on the commission, as I said, for almost half a decade. And during that time, I have had the great privilege of traveling all across this country and to all corners of the land. And I can report firsthand that the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well in America. Just this March, I took my first road trip as chairman, uh, visiting Pittsburgh and Youngstown and Cleveland and Detroit. Along the way, I met with an incredible array of startups. A mobile app company that is already helping 80 million people around the world learn new languages for free. A virtual reality gaming entrepreneur. A new online platform to provide treatment for people with addiction. And many, many more like them. I also visited established entities like the Cleveland Clinic, where I witnessed a demonstration of a mobile stroke unit that is using new technology to cut the time needed to assess and stabilize a stroke patient by an average of 38 
minutes, critical minutes, when you consider that the brain for a stroke patient loses two million cells every single minute. And whether it's someone tinkering in a small town garage or a uh, growing company in a major technology hub, we at the FCC want to help American entrepreneurs bring these big ideas to life. And that's why we've put in place a process to implement at long last Section 7 of the Communications Act, a long neglected law. Going forward, if an innovator uh, or an inventor files a petition or application at the FCC for the approval of a new technology or service, we will abide by the law and we will make a decision within one year. There will be no more waiting indefinitely for an answer. As the old saying goes, tell me yes, tell me no, or just tell me something. Uh, now, that's why we've changed our experimental licensing program, and we've launched a new website to make it easier for parties to register proposed new experiments. This new type of experimental license will allow greater flexibility for parties, including universities and research labs and healthcare facilities and manufacturers of radio frequency equipment, to develop their technologies and services while protecting incumbent services against harmful interference. That's why, as Jeff pointed out, we authorized the first ever LTE unlicensed devices in the five gigahertz band, a significant advance for wireless innovation and spectrum sharing. And this gives wireless consumers the best of both worlds, a more robust and seamless networks when their phones are relying on cellular networks and the continued enjoyment of Wi-Fi. And that's why we began the process of allowing television broadcasters to fully enter the digital age by using the next generation television standard on a voluntary market-driven basis. This new transmission standard known as ATSC 3.0 is the first one to marry the advantages of broadcasting and the internet. And it could let broadcasters offer much better services in various ways, 4K transmissions, immersive audio, better accessibility options, and much, much more. Now, one more point about our approach to promoting innovation. We want to encourage innovation throughout the internet economy. And that means innovation not just at the edge of the networks, but also innovation at the core of those networks, within the networks themselves. Also, we want to encourage business model innovation and more options for consumers. And that's a big reason why we closed the FCC's investigation into free data offerings. Wireless companies offering consumers something for free has, shockingly, proven popular among consumers, especially low-income Americans. And it's also made the wireless marketplace more competitive than ever. Going forward, the FCC will seek to promote, not to prevent, that kind of innovation. And that leads to our fourth guiding priority, which is protecting consumers, and that goes hand-in-hand -hand with promoting public safety. The most effective tool for protecting consumers is a competitive marketplace. But as we've seen, competition sometimes is, no, is not enough to guard consumers against scams and other unsavory practices. When consumers feel they are being taken advantage of, they often turn to the FCC for help. And this FCC is taking action. The number one source of consumer complaints at the FCC in, for many years has been robocalls. We have all experienced them during our daily lives. And here the agency has moved aggressively to save Americans from the scourge of Rachel from cardholder services and many of her friends. Uh, we have sought to give providers more leeway to block calls that used a spoofed uh, caller ID number. And that seemed to be from an unassigned or invalid phone number. This would impede the illegitimate callers and the scam artists who often engage in call spoofing and prey upon some of our most vulnerable populations. We've also taken action to protect consumers, many of whom are small businesses from scams. For instance, we levied a $1 million fine against a Florida-based long-distance carrier for impersonating representatives of customers' existing long-distance providers and illegally switching the customers' long-distance carriers. Now, another area where the, this FCC has made a mark is in ensuring that communication services are accessible to Americans with disabilities. For instance, we have already taken steps to improve the quality and the efficiency of video relay services. And these are services that help people who are deaf, hard of hearing, or speech disabled communicate. Our reforms will encourage more competition, and they will help make these services more useful and meaningful to disabled Americans in their daily lives. And public safety is another dimension of consumer protection. 
Again, this is a principle that is rooted in our founding statute, which charges the FCC with protecting the safety of life and property through communications. One area uh, in which we've delivered results involves the problem of contraband cell phones. These devices are being smuggled into prisons and jails across the country. I've seen it for myself in minimum security facilities in Massachusetts to maximum security facilities in Georgia. And these devices are smuggled into prisons and jails to be used for hits on witnesses, scams on innocent consumers, and many other illicit purposes, all of which impact guards and inmates and all of us ultimately. I'm proud to say that here, the FCC unanimously adopted reforms that will enable correctional facilities to detect and to block the use of these contraband cell phones. And we're also looking at other technological solutions going forward. Outside of the rulemaking process, we also rushed to the aid of Jewish community centers and law enforcement to help combat a wave of bomb threats earlier this year. And when a major 911 outage hit a couple of months ago, we immediately launched an investigation to figure out what had happened and what could be done to prevent it from happening again. Now, the last priority that I would like to highlight is enhancing transparency and improving the way the agency does business. Long before I became chairman, I said that good process drives good policy. As you may have heard back then, I had some problems with FCC processes. Uh, one of my favorite targets was the practice of preventing the public from seeing a proposal or order until after the FCC voted on it. I was told for many years it was unlawful to change course or unwise to do so. But having spent almost five years talking about ways we could do things better, I was eager to begin doing things differently. And we did. In the category of they said it couldn't be done, we started making the text of items available to the public on the internet three weeks in advance of commission meetings. Of all of the things that we've done over our first 100 days, that is one of the initiatives that I've heard the most positive feedback about. Indeed, now that we let the sunlight in, it's hard to remember why this was even a controversial proposal in the first place. And to me, at least, this is a useful reminder of two things. Number one, never underestimate the power of government inertia. Number two, when the most common defense for a long-standing practice is, that's just the way we've always done it, it might be a signal to think outside the box and to begin doing things differently. Now, speaking of doing things differently, I have long been concerned that the economists uh, at the agency have not been systematically incorporated into the FCC's policy work. Instead, their expertise is typically applied in an ad hoc fashion and often late into the process. Moreover, the economists are sprinkled among the agency's many bureaus and offices. Well, we are taking a major step toward correcting that. A month ago, I kick-started the process to establish an Office of Economics and Data. This office will combine economists and data professionals from around the FCC. And I envision it providing economic analysis for rulemakings, transactions, and auctions, managing the commission's data resources, and conducting longer-term research, those famed white papers, for instance, on ways to improve the Commission's long-term policies. Now, my goal is to have this new office up and running by the end of the year. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the prior work done by Jeff Eisenach, by Roz Layton, Mark Jamison, and many others for providing the intellectual foundation for creating this office. So there you have it, a recap of our first 100 days. Now, obviously, this is not an exhaustive list. For example, I mentioned neither the FCC's incentive auction nor my infamous Reese's peanut butter mug. But I hope I have illustrated, uh, at least in brief, how we intend to meet the core priorities of this agency. Closing the digital divide, modernizing our rules, uh, promoting innovation, protecting consumers and public safety, and improving the agency's operations. Now, it's also important to note that our accomplishments over the first 100 days were truly a team effort. Commissioners Mignon Clyburn and Mike O'Reilly have been critical partners in the Commission's work. For example, when it comes to closing the digital divide, Commissioner Clyburn has played a vital role and has offered many productive suggestions. Commissioner O'Reilly has been a leader when it comes to process reform and to easing modern uh, unnecessary regulatory burdens, and I could have no better partner than him. So I would like to take this opportunity to publicly thank each of them for the work they have done over the past several months. 
Even in those rare instances when we have disagreed, the exchange of our views has made for a better ultimate work product. And of course, I must thank the unsung heroes of the FCC, our amazing staff. None of what we have accomplished so far would have been possible without their efforts. I'm well aware that many of them have worked very long hours over the last 100 days, often under very tight deadlines. But their work has been stellar, their demeanor has been professional, and their dedication to the cause has been unflagging. And so I appreciate all the sacrifices that they have made in order to advance the public interest. Now, as for me, I am, of course, pleased that we've gotten off to a fast start. But I would stress that that's all it is, just a start. A good beginning, of course, is no guarantee of ultimate success. If you don't believe me, ask the 2017 Atlanta Falcons, the 2016 Golden State Warriors, the 1986 Red Sox, and many other teams. So there's a lot more to do in these fields. And I'm looking forward to doing it, to building a brighter digital future for all Americans. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks again to AEI for hosting us. And I look forward to continuing to work with you in the years to come. Thanks. So we're going to uh, engage in a conversation here for just a couple of minutes, and then we'll turn the floor open to, to questions. Uh, so one topic you didn't talk about in your speech, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and raise, so just so it doesn't go un, unmentioned. I, I bet we get a question or two about it also. Uh, and that is the open internet proceeding. Um, I'm not familiar with that. That's <laughs> is, that, is that a big deal? I've, I've read something about that recently. Um, so, uh, you know, without kind of getting deep into the substance of the thing, again, you know, you've written on that at length and, and um, uh, you know, I think the, the arguments are well understood, but, but maybe looking ahead at process, um, first of all, the process at the FCC, the last time this issue came around was criticized. Uh, so maybe speak a little bit about the process as you see it. Um, and the process reforms and how they play into the FCC's deliberations. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also, how do you see the role of Congress, how do you see the role of the courts in resolving you know, what's obviously a contentious issue? A great question. Uh, so first and foremost, we want to make sure that this is a uh, proceeding that respects the Administrative Procedure Act and sort of the basic principles of good government. And that's why it was really important to me uh, that the pilot project that I announced in my second week in office uh, extended to all of the proposals that we, we would be considering, including this one. And so that's why after I made a speech where I outlined my proposal to uh, reform our internet regulations, I wanted to put it up on the internet immediately. And as I said at the time, uh, you may disagree with what I proposed, you may agree with it, but at least you'll be able to see exactly what it was that I was thinking and why. And that's really important to me because I don't claim to have a monopoly on wisdom. I think it's important for the public to feel like they have a seat at the table. And for the FCC to simply say, this is our plan, just trust us, this is what's in it, is not good enough for me, as what happened in the last iteration. And so uh, going forward, we're going to have a very open and transparent process. Following on May 18th, if the notice of proposed rulemaking is adopted, uh, we will have approximately three months for public comments. We've already had several weeks of that. Um, and uh, I think until August 16th is the time for the public to have its say. And at that point, uh, the FCC's uh, staff, which is dedicated, as I pointed out, they'll take stock of the facts in the record. And uh, then we, at the appropriate time, will make the judgment based on those facts and the law as we interpret it. Now, speaking of the law, you asked about the courts. And here, too, I think uh, we are guided, of course, uh, by uh, the decisions that the courts have made. And so I think it's important to remember, number one, uh, that the Supreme Court in 2005 explicitly blessed uh, the path that we have proposed to take. Uh, in fact, just uh, earlier this week, when the D.C. Circuit rejected the en banc petition uh, for review, uh, they sp explicitly say, you can see it at the bottom of page four of the court's opinion, where uh, Judge Srinivasan and Judge Tatel uh, recognize that uh, the Brand X decision stands for the proposition that the agency has discretion about how to classify uh, Internet access. And so uh, going forward, we, of course, want to be guided by these legal principles, and uh, that's uh, something that's uh, very important to us. Uh, you also mentioned uh, Congress. Uh, Congress, of course, has uh, very great interest in these issues, and that's why I've been doing outreach to, to members of Congress on both sides of the aisle and to both houses of Capitol Hill uh, to make sure that I make myself as accessible as I can be. And uh, people might end up disagreeing. Of course, this is a topic that I recognize as highly fraught with uh, you know, political differences and policy differences, but at the end of the day, 
I think that a lot of the uh, rhetoric obscures the basic point that I've been trying to make, which is that the Clinton administration got it right in the 1990s, the dawn of the internet age. This is not a radical position that I've been trotting out. This was the reality from the dawn of the commercial internet until 2015. I mean, if you go back and look at uh, President Clinton's uh, statement, the internet should develop unfettered from federal and state regulation. Go back and look at my predecessor, Chairman Kennard's statements that he, at the crossroads of the internet, uh, at the beginning, he didn't want to dump, as he put it, the morass of Title II on the internet pipe. Take a look at the bipartisan statements that we saw from many senators, including Senators Wyden and former Senator Kerry, where they urged the FCC not to reclassify this new technology as a Title II service. So there's a reason why they did that. It's because they saw the potential of this new technology and they didn't want to import the legacy rules from the Ma Bell monopoly years into this new and evolving service. And so all I'm simply saying going forward is that, you know, I recognize that you know, some people would prefer government micromanagement of everything internet. Uh, some people would prefer it to be the Wild West, no regulation at all. My approach is pretty simple. Let's go down this middle path of light touch Clinton era regulation. It's uh, proved to work. It's given us $1.5 trillion in infrastructure investment, the internet economy, it's the envy of the world. It's the very reason that some of you at this very moment are able to tweet out your vigorous disagreement with whatever I just said. It's, a, it's one of the great platforms, I think, for democratization and entrepreneurship and engagement. And let's just keep that going, going forward. Well, that's, uh, thank you for that. And, and um, spe speaking of Chairman Kennard and, and the Clinton administration, uh, Chairman Kennard's strategic plan from 1999 talked about um, the growth of competition. And he said that, you know, our ability to move down the path of a less regulatory approach depends ultimately on some things occurring in terms of, of uh, he talked specifically about whether DSL would ever, you know, how, how that technology would develop. He talked, high, you know, looking forward, he looked, uh, talked about, I wonder how cable modem technology will ever develop and will that be really a good way to get to the, to the, the uh, internet. Um, another part of that competitive uh, milieu uh, is uh, the question of wireless and wireline competition. Right. Um, so yesterday, if I think I got this right, the CDC reported that for the first time there are more mobile-only telephone consumers and households in the United States than there are wired uh, 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 households in the United States. So my question is, um, I, I don't think, you, if this is in some particular proceeding or something you can't answer, I understand, but, but just as in general, would you think at this point that wireless is a competitor or a substitute for wireline and the FCC might, is, is the Phoenix decision still law? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. I mean, to me at least, uh, they are uh, very competitive offerings. It's, if you look at how consumers are using their mobile devices, uh, the phone call is one of the last things that people typically think about now when they pick up a phone. And that's a remarkable transformation. I mean, mm -hmm. for those of us of a certain age at least, I still remember remember those big uh, you know, phones that were hard to hold and you'd make a voice call and the quality was scratchy. You thought, what, you know, how is this device ever going to uh, become an integral part of life? But starting with the iPhone in introduction in 2007, all the way until 2017, it's incredible to see how we use these devices. And you know, I, I look at the apps that I use every single day. It's, uh, it's amazing from fast food to Twitter to checking my email to you know, reserving a flight. Uh, our iPhones are sort of these platforms for innovation. And so the internet is a critical part of that. And especially as 4G LTE gets rolled out, as 5G networks uh, with gigabit uh, throughput or even more uh, become possible, as uh, the next generation of Wi-Fi comes on board, so we're able to, for instance, uh, free up 5 gigahertz spectrum or even 60 and 70 gigahertz spectrum for wireless innovation. I think we're increasingly going to see that wireless is not just this imperfect substitute for uh, wired connections, it is going to be the dominant means by which people access the internet, the preferable means. And so I think the FCC needs to take stock of that and uh, make the appropriate uh, policy decisions as a result. Well, I agree. I, the, the reference, uh, and I, 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 this just occurred to me earlier today, and I haven't looked it up. The Phoenix decision was Cox applied for deregulation in the Phoenix marketplace, MSA, and this was not that many years ago. And the commission's decision was based on the conclusion, uh, to deny the request, was right. based on the, on the conclusion that wireless voice cell phones were not a substitute. And as far as I know, that's still law. Yeah. 
isn't it? So maybe that I speaking clean. I believe it is. Yeah. Regulatory underbrush. Maybe maybe we could concede those. Yeah. That's um, well. Certainly, it's also important to note that for purposes of the Title II order, I mean, the FCC had no problem lumping wireless in with wired networks. Right. And so, <laughs> I mean, you know, under the well-established case of Goose versus Gander, I think it's important to be consistent here right. and, uh, right. you know, to right. take a holistic view of the marketplace. That's. Uh, I, know, I, I, I decided convergence had taken a major step when Microsoft Microsoft calling stopped calling <laughs> the stuff on my Windows 10. Um, uh, operating system programs and started calling the maps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <right. laughs> We've converged. <laughs> um, the um, so uh, another thing that you, you've been active with over the course of the past 102 days um, is collaborating in a number of ways with our mutual friend Maureen Olhausen over at the Federal yeah. Trade Commission. So talk, talk a little bit about the FTC FCC collaboration and how you see that playing out over time. Uh, Chairwoman Olhausen has been a terrific partner, uh, not just over the last 102 days, but over the last several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've really enjoyed the chance to work with her uh, on some of the issues that uh, have raised a lot of uh, public attention. For example, privacy. Uh, she and I have consistently said that we share the same goal here. And the goal is a consistent and comprehensive framework that protects consumers whenever they go online. And so I've uh, really been grateful, uh, not just to call her a friend, but also to rely on her as a resource to let us know what the FTC's capabilities are, what the scope of its legal authorities are, and what the best way to secure consumer protection in the digital age is. And so uh, going forward, that's certainly going to be uh, the case. I know that my staff and hers have collaborated closely as well. And uh, I'm really excited about the chance to uh, deliver more results on that does score. The, does the FCC chairman support the uh, uh, end of the common carrier exemption at the Federal Trade Commission? I think our time is coming to a close. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I can't take an official position on that's a decision for, for Congress to make, obviously, in consultation with the Federal Trade Commission. But uh, that's one of the areas that I know Chairwoman Olhausen and uh, even Commissioner McSweeney, I believe, have uh, called for congressional attention. Yeah, I was at the FTC in the 1980s, and we were pushing for ending the common carrier exemption. So, um, yeah. so the FCC, FTC would like that. Um, well, I, I want to stop there. We've got about 15 minutes left, and we promise to have time for questions from the audience. So uh, I'll stop my questions there. and, and uh, uh, the floor is open. We have microphones uh, with staff on the sides, and so raise your hand, identify yourself. We'll take the first one here and uh, wait for the microphone to come to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Rob Colorina, at AIAC Investment Group. Um, you mentioned some time on the road. I was curious as to how you manage your travel. What are you thinking about? outside sort of the major cities and into the rural or through the SME kind of territories? A great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, I love uh, traveling throughout those parts of the country that I, one typically would not go as a tourist. Uh, during that same trip, for instance, uh, I stopped in Zelyanople, Pennsylvania, population I think 3,812. Believe it or not, Zelyanople is sort of the hub in terms of internet access for a big territory in western Pennsylvania. And it was really useful for me to be able to see that cable head end to understand uh, how that head-end was trying to deliver internet access to hilly parts of Western PA and to see the business and economic challenges uh, and technical challenges that were involved in internet access. And to be honest, those are the, the trips that resonate the most with me. Uh, you're traveling to Dillard, Nebraska and getting to meet Chad and Courtney Lottman who've used the internet to build uh, a beef um, jerky distribution company that uh, is shipping nationwide. It's incredible. Uh, going to Fort Yukon, Alaska and getting to see how a teacher is able to connect with her students, uh, most of whom are Alaska natives in ways that were unthinkable a generation ago. Uh, visiting Carthage, Mississippi and looking at a gigabit fiber deployment that uh, was never considered possible uh, during the analog age. Uh, even going back to my hometown of Parsons, Kansas and uh, you're seeing some of the challenges there. Uh, my own high school, for instance, uh, either didn't apply for E-rate funding or uh, didn't get the funding that they needed in order to uh, get better digital services. And that sort of brought home to me, at least, the fact that uh, my own successors at Parsons High School uh, weren't necessarily getting a, a, the same opportunities as some of their brethren in bigger places. And so those are the visits that are really important to me. I grew up in a small town. I grew up in rural America. Uh, however long I might have lived in a big city, I'm still a small town American at heart. And I'm keenly aware that the digital divide uh, wrecks uh, the greatest inequality uh, when it comes to uh, smaller towns. And so uh, going forward, I'm going to continue doing those visits because it helps keep me grounded and it helps keep my eyes on the prize here, which is that ubiquitous internet access so that every American who wants it is able to get it is ultimately something that's going to make our na nation much better off. I'd also point out, by the way, that uh, when I've had a chance to talk to my international counterparts, 
Interestingly, this is the number one priority that they talk about as well. I met my counterpart in Nigeria, for example, in February, and I was struck by the fact that he told me that 40% of Nigerians lack internet access at all. And those are extremely uh, poor rural villages uh, in particular. Uh, a couple of years ago when I went to India, I sat in the outskirts of a small village in Bangalore and I saw that uh, internet access for uh, poor women was extremely important, especially over their mobile phones, because that allowed them to uh, get and transmit money, which allowed them to start their own businesses. In Colombia, I met some small startup entrepreneurs from rural areas that were developing apps that allowed, for instance, fishermen to be able to better communicate uh, in order to uh, assess where the fish were and try to figure out where the marketplace opportunity was. And so this is not a, an American phenomenon. And uh, the other point I'll just stress in closing is that I, when I met recently with Senator Angus King, outside of his office, he has a wonderful poster of JFK with a quote on it. And it says, you know, let us not search for the Republican answer. Let us not search for the Democratic answer. Let us search for the right answer. And notwithstanding the political vicissitudes of you know, the open internet order or the other things that occupy the headlines, at the end of the day, I remain optimistic, perhaps foolishly so, that internet access is something we can all rally around, that all of us are better off as Americans uh, when we focus on that prize. And rural America, at least to me, is uh, squarely in uh, the, uh, the heart of, of that prize. Other questions? I see one in the back of the room here. Uh, I'm Stephen Nikas, I'm with the Carnegie Endowment next door. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering, one of the uh, greatest ways to foster low cost and efficient internet access in new areas is gonna be through fostering competition. Uh, can you talk about measures that you might, the FCC might be engaged in to uh, foster ISP competition specifically? And with the light touch that you're talking about from yeah. the Clinton era, uh, means of monitoring and ensuring that that is an equal playing field for, uh, for startup or uh, smaller ISPs and the larger ISP, ISP companies? A, a fa fantastic question. So here we've been extremely aggressive. As you heard during the speech, uh, for instance, uh, we, well, so we have two basic tools in the toolbox. One is the wise stewardship of the federal subsidy programs that the FCC oversees, and the other is the regulatory framework, the rules of the road that we set for the private sector. So with respect to federal subsidies, uh, the bottom line philosophy that I've tried to apply to these programs, which I'm glad that my colleagues have supported, is making sure that we redirect funding to the areas that are unserved, to Americans who are off the grid altogether, and make sure they are devoted to carriers who are committed and have been proven to be committed to developing broadband networks in those areas. And these are not the big companies by definition because you don't see as big of a return on the investment in these areas. These are some of the smaller companies that are taking these funds and in a fiscally responsible way applying them to close that digital divide. Additionally, uh, we've also, also taken a number of other universal service actions uh, along those lines. Uh, just last month, for instance, at our meeting, uh, we took a very arcane step, which I mentioned briefly, uh, to change our CapEx rules, which inadvertently stood in the way of companies wanting to deliver high-speed access to some of the highest cost areas within their territory. And that was perversely a way of essentially redlining off entire rural areas from broadband deployment. Uh, so the second major way we want to incentivize competition is through adjusting our rules. And here I'm really excited in particular about the impact of small uh, wireless and wired broadband competitors. On the wireless side, for instance, I've consistently said that one of the reasons I believe so much in five gigahertz spectrum is that could be used by fixed wireless providers to be a competitive alternative to their wired brethren. And so if we were able, for instance, to get five gigahertz spectrum that is, uh, involves very wide channels, then they can supply very high uh, speeds to competitors, it would be essentially comparable, hopefully, to the fixed broadband networks. And you know, especially if you don't need to deploy all that fixed infrastructure that uh, uh, you would on the wired side, that could be a pretty important competitor, especially in rural areas. Uh, with respect to the wired comp competitors too, we've made sure that we take steps to relieve some of the regulatory burdens to make it easier for them to build a business case to compete with the big guys. So for example, the creation of the business, the, the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee, the BDAC, they're targeting ways to get, make it easier for these smaller competitors to gain access uh, to poles, to make it cheaper for, cheaper for them to attach equipment to poles, uh, for them to be able to get access to the conduit that's in the ground, uh, for them to get quicker state and local approval for some of these deployments. I mean, if you think about it, these regulatory uh, barriers, they affect everybody who wants to be an ISP, but especially the smaller competitors. And just to give you one quick example of that, I visited with a company called Rocket Fiber, a small ISP, a startup ISP in Detroit, Michigan. And they told me when they've initially tried to go to the city of Detroit to get access to the city-owned poles, 
uh, Detroit quoted them a price of something like, I want to say $3,000, maybe even $5,000 for each and every poll. And if you're a small ISP, I mean, come on, you're <laughs> in a city as uh, densely depopulated as Detroit, that price is prohibitive. But negotiating down the, the price, they were able to get access at a reasonable uh, cost to them. And not every ISP is so lucky, and so we want to reduce that cost element in order to help those smaller competitors. And uh, moving forward, uh, last September, I proposed uh, and my digital empowerment agenda, one critical part of that was for Congress to give the FCC additional authority in this area. Help us create, for example, gigabit opportunity zones, which would allow us to designate either large rural counties or even small urban areas as 75% uh, or less of the national median income. And in those areas, we would provide tax incentives to these small companies to provide a competitive alternative. I'm thrilled to see that Senator Capito I recently introduced legislation just this week on that very score. Uh, similarly, we would love for the agent, uh, for Congress to consider giving us additional authority over utility poles that are uh, or poles that are owned by uh, governments and railroads. Very arcane. It's never going to make the front page of any newspaper. But given the fact that this is a major cost element for smaller competitive ISPs, that can really help us attack that com competition equation in a way that would be good, I think, for consumers in the long run. Uh, should we go here? No one on the side. You yeah. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Wait for the mic. Okay. You guys need to step up. The <laughs> Hi, uh, Bill Hello. Signer with the Carmen Group. Uh, first, thank you for coming and speaking today. Um, your comments, are, this is personal about the robocalls. Oh. <laughs> Whatever you do about that is great because I got one while we were sitting here. <laughs> so, so, um, I hope you didn't pay up. <laughs> I, I did not, but I will tell you that uh, one of my thoughts about that is you should be going after the people who benefit, not the, the companies Absolutely. that are doing the calls, but the end beneficiaries of, of that. So you could be finding them, and I think that would be great. Yeah. Uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is I work with the burglar and fire alarm industry. Okay. Very highly competitive industry, uh, overwhelmingly small business and uh, involved in public sa safety. We're concerned that the common carriers, when they become competitors of ours, that basically they use that control over the network to get a competitive advantage. Uh, you may be aware there are provisions in the law that protect us. We are concerned that, and this is not a net neutrality issue. What, what we're concerned about is if things in Title II, which is where we are, go over to the Federal Trade Commission. Mm -hmm. By the time we get heard, a lot of our small businesses are going to be put out of business. So the two things we would like to see happen is one, continuation under FCC jurisdiction for at least the alarm complaints and issues, and two, um, making sure, well, that's basically the, the major thing we're concerned about. Okay. So. Oh, thanks for flagging that concern. It's been a while since I took, at the, uh, took a look at the legal framework surrounding these issues, but I'd be happy to consider it. In the meantime, uh, please do file uh, either in an existing proceeding or if there's uh, uh, a petition or application that you sign. The second part of it oh. is um, because it only applies basically to landlines, we want to be modernized to make sure it applies to the internet service providers. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I'd be happy to take a look. And okay. so. Uh, you send some paper our way, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to carve out some time to take a look at it. Great. I think we have time for one more question, probably. We've had the left. It's time for the right. <laughs> right, left. We try to. I got one right back here. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Chairman. Um, wait for the mic, please. <laughs> Not the far right. This is the moderate right. <laughs> <laughs> David Hatch with uh, Deal Reporter. So the, um, the previous FCC did not look favorably at reducing the number of nationwide wireless carriers from four to three. And given the statements that you just made about the level of competition, is that a possibility that you'd be open to? I uh, take the role of the, uh, my, my approach to the regulatory role is one of humility, that I don't claim to know in a vacuum what the optimal market structure of any particular marketplace is, what the right number of competitors should be. Our, our goal is always to make sure that the marketplace functions in a way that benefits the public interest. And so uh, to me at least, uh, we take a look at the marketplace as it stands, try to figure out uh, is there competition, are prices going down, are, is application and uh, service innovation going up? those kinds of things, and then make the appropriate judgment, uh, for instance, through our wireless competition report. Uh, if any transaction is presented to us, the framework I've applied, 
and I've consistently applied going back to my statements on November 30th of 2011 when I was a nominee was that we always evaluate transactions based on the public interest standard. Now, figuring out whether the consummation of that transaction would be good for competition and consumers um, and uh, make the appropriate judgment thereafter. And uh, you know, that's the framework that I'm going to apply going forward if we're presented with any uh, transactional reviews. I'm, I'm told we'll take one more, and I saw one more hand over I think here. I saw so. uh, someone. Hi. Here, one more here. Do we have a mic? Do you? Yes. Here we go. Behind the fellow with a stylish fedora. Yeah. Um, uh, Marion Bax with Morning Consult. I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about. Um, I don't know if this is related to the federal subsidy you were talking about earlier, but. Um, uh, Commissioner Clyborne had suggested that the way that the universal service fee is funded right now is unsustainable since it's coming mostly from landline phones. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how um, federal subsidies will be collected in the future if there are changes to that? Sure. So to the uh, folks who are uh, blissfully uh, unfamiliar with this area, um, the Universal Service Fund is funded by essentially a tax that is on every phone bill that a consumer pays. And so if you look at your bill, you see universal service fee. Uh, those fees go into essentially a, a pot of money that the FCC oversees. Uh, there are four different universal service and programs, one of which I mentioned today, the high cost program uh, for delivering broadband to rural America and unserved America. Um, so the, uh, yeah, that fee uh, is something that varies over time. Uh, the FCC and uh, it's uh, the company that oversees for administering this, pro um, this uh, program uh, make a determination about what that contribution factor, as it's called, should be. And there's an, uh, there are existing bodies to determine uh, you know, whether the fee should be adjusted. Uh, right now, my colleague, Commissioner O'Reilly, is the chair of a, what's called a joint board that oversees uh, these issues, and they're squarely tackling uh, that question. So uh, we haven't, uh, you know, this discussion has been ongoing for quite a while, and we haven't made any der determinations yet. So uh, I hate to pass the buck to my good friend, but uh, since he's the chairman of that relevant joint board, uh, I would have to defer uh, answering, uh, yeah, you're free to talk to him if you like about that question. Process reform and action. I know, what I feel think? bad imposing homework on my colleagues. Uh, Ajita, uh, it, it, <laughs> it's, it, it's been wonderful having you here. You know, you learn something uh, every time. I always learn something when I listen to you. Today I learned something I didn't expect, that you'd spend so much time in prison. Um, <laughs> so right. it's, 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 I wasn't on your CV, but um, thanks for letting us know. Voluntarily, and, uh, <laughs> I hate so bad. For those watching at home. Right. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much for being here. I ask everyone to join me in thanking Ajita. Also, stay seated as, uh, as we're leaving here. Thanks so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. It's fun. It's great. Yeah, what a yeah. great forum, too. I love this place.